Let's pray. Father, we again come before you. We worship you. Thank you for the hope that we have within us. And that this is not the end, it's only the beginning. Help us, I pray, this day, Father, to really rest, to rest in the resurrection to rest in our salvation, to rest in our eternity, that when you declared it is finished, it's finished indeed, you had won the day. You had won for the whole of eternity. That death, our final fear, and that final frontier was dealt the blow, the victory blow, that we would have eternal life in you. And that eternal life is knowing you, Heavenly Father, and knowing your Son in whom you sent, for this is eternal life. And so, Father, I pray that we will rest in that here today, that we will rest in this great truth always. And, Father, we would pray for anyone and everyone who is here this day, that if they don't know you, they will come to know you here today. That their restlessness will bring them to the cross and they'll find the rest they need for their souls. They'll find that in you here today. And so we pray that this would be the day of salvation. This is the day for rejoicing. This is the day for all of our praise to you. Help us, we ask in this moment, to be attentive to your word. And let your word ring loudly into our ears so that it penetrates our hearts, rekindles our faith, revives our spirits. And then send us from this place this day out into a world that would celebrate this holiday for a day off. May they be found celebrating a risen Savior this day. Help us to be the salt and light that you call us to be. And may we worship at your feet, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. Well, it is the Easter season, which means we are bombarded with religious movies and all of the sorts. The Ten Commandments. How many have seen the Ten Commandments at least ten times? Twenty. When I was younger, it was Jesus of Nazareth. I remember watching that movie when I was in, I don't know, maybe junior high, young high school. I'm not even going to give you the year. But being moved to tears as I contemplated the reality of the cross and all that Jesus endured. And then came along the passion of Christ, raised the bar to a whole new level. Most of us have seen that movie. Not everyone likes it, not everyone enjoys it. But one thing about this movie that it does, like no other, is it raises our understanding of the last 12 hours of Christ's life and Christ's ministry. It draws us into what is called the passion narratives in a way like no other movie has ever drawn us into that passion narrative. It rips our emotions. It rips our emotions apart as we watch Christ suffer in the worst of ways possible it leaves us in silence as we witness the cruelty hurled against our Savior. It leaves us sickened 
in our souls that humanity could display such brutal hatred. It tears away at every fiber of our being as we witness the agony that Christ endured. I think it leaves us stripped of all comfort as we recognize our own hand in his death. And I think it leaves us stunned as we watch innocence pounded to the cross by injustice. Most of all, that movie leaves us wondering. Wondering how people could be so cruel. Wondering how a humanity could be so cruel. Wondering how Christ could have endured such suffering. Wondering why they would crucify someone so innocent and so pure. Wondering why everyone seemed to turn so silent in Christ's defense. Wondering why everyone seemed to turn away from Christ in the end. Most of all, it leaves many wondering why. Why did Christ have to endure such pain? Why did Christ have to endure such heartache? Why did Christ have to endure such brutal cruelty? While the movie clearly depicts Christ's death and his incredible suffering, it doesn't clearly answer the question of why Christ had to suffer and die. To watch the movie, to read the gospel story, to see Christ suffer and die, and not know why is the greatest tragedy anybody can ever suffer. To watch all of that and walk away and not know why is one of the great tragedies of life. To miss the purpose of the passion is to miss God's purpose in sending his Son. The question of why did Christ have to suffer and die is simply answered because he had to. Why did Christ have to suffer and die? Because he he had to. And I know it sounds outrageous, but our God is an outrageous God. And he's an outrageous God because, as some would say, His love is an outrageous love. It goes beyond human comprehension. It exceeds that which is normal. It surpasses all boundaries. It goes well beyond and defies all human reasoning. God's love wants our very best. And to give us his very best, his son had to die. What we need most in this life is to be right with God. That is what's best for us. It's why we've been created, to walk in intimacy with the God who made us, the God who created us. And to experience God's best for us is to live our lives in love with him. But alas, Scripture makes it clear that we've all violated God in one way or another. We've lived apart from Him. We've lived in opposition to Him. We've lived based on our own standards, all the while violating God's standards. And so what we need most to be right with God is forgiveness. And forgiveness is impossible apart from Christ's death and his sacrifice. Why did Christ have to die? (laughs) Because he had to. Because we needed him to. Christ carried the cross so we could be forgiven, to be restored completely to God. That is the essence of our faith. And it's the foundation 
that we stand upon. That Christ died for the ungodly. That Christ died for the likes of you and I. God's love wants our very best. And to give us his very best, Christ had to die. 1 John chapter 4, verses 9-10 through 10 tells us, By this the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we loved God, no. But that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, to be the mercy seat, to be the place of atonement for our sins. We live in a guilt-ridden world. Many of us are riddled with guilt in our lives, guilt and shame. We just can't seem to shake it. Most of us feel guilty about something or guilty about someone. Some of us feel guilty over the things that we've done in this life. You can't seem to shake it. And some of us feel guilty over things we didn't accomplish in this life. And some of us feel guilty as parents. We didn't provide enough. We didn't care enough. We didn't protect enough. Some of us feel guilty for the ways that we have mistreated others, mistreated our parents, mistreated our children, mistreated our friends. And some of us feel guilty for the thoughts that you have or we have. Some of us feel guilty for the things we say. Some of us feel guilty for the things that we never said. But you wish you could go back in time and have the opportunity to say them once for all. Some of us feel guilty because you don't pray enough. Others because they don't come to church enough. Some feel guilty because they didn't come to church on time. Most of us feel guilty about something or someone. But deep, deep, deep down, we're all guilty before God. And so we all long for forgiveness. Forgiveness from others for what we've done, what we've said. Forgiveness from ourselves for where we've failed or those times where we've fallen. Most of all, we all long to be forgiven by God. To know from the depths of our souls that we're right with him, that we have a right relationship with him. And in order to accomplish this, God sent his son with a passion for souls. That's the passion narrative. That's the passion that brought him to the cross. Men didn't lead him there. Rulers didn't lead him there. Nobody led him there but the father and the Spirit, and Himself. Not a second sooner, not a second later, but in the appointed time, in the anointed time, our Lord Jesus took on the cross. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, He made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in Him his passion. He who knew no sin took on our sin that he could place upon us and clothe us with the righteousness of his son. 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 18, for Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust. Why? In order that he might bring us to God having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. The whole purpose of the passion is that we might find pardon in the sight of a holy God. And so if you're here today and you're looking to find forgiveness in the sight of God, 
then you need to know that it can only be found in the Son of God. First of all, God's forgiveness is communicated through his Son. It is communicated and declared through his Son. Christ tells us in the Gospel of John that he who has seen me has seen the Father. So often people say, if I could only see God, if I could only see the face of God. And if you're here this morning and you want to see the living God, then you simply need to look into the face of Jesus. For he is the exact representation of his heavenly Father. In him, the fullness of deity dwells. If you're here and you're longing to see your heavenly Father, you need to look and gaze into his heavenly Son. In the person of Christ, we get to see God in real life, in real space, in real time, and in a very, very real way. In the incarnation, we get, to see, we get to see God in action. In the incarnation, we get to see God's love. We get to see God's mercy. We get to see God's compassion. You ever question that? Read through the gospel narratives, and you'll see over and over again, our Lord reaching out to the unreachable, our Lord reaching out and touching the untouchable, Extending love to the unlovable. And over and over again we hear, and moved with compassion, Christ reached out to the unreachable. But we get to see firsthand God's perfect forgiveness. Without the ministry of Christ, we couldn't see it. We'd hope for it, but we couldn't see it. But my, oh my, how we see it expressed in the life and through the ministry and in the wonder of his son. Simply read through the Gospels and watch the forgiveness flow from our Lord and our Savior. Look at the woman at the well. A life filled with sin. A life filled with guilt. A life filled with many men. Too many men. A life filled with many failures. And because of that, a life filled with many, many tears. Yet Christ came along and said she could be filled with living water. And her soul would be restored. Salty tears flowing down the face of a neglected woman. A mistreated woman, replaced with tears of joy that flow fresh, crystal clear, crystal clean, living water. Look at the adulterous woman who's dragged into the city square to be stoned to death. Can you imagine the fear in that poor woman's life? The panic with her own very heart, scorned by her sisters, sentenced by society, soon to be stoned to death. They dragged her before Christ to see what should be done with her. I mean, after all, what do we do with the likes of someone like this? And how does Christ respond? He displays compassion. And kindness. He doesn't ignore her sin, but he does offer her forgiveness if she'll change her ways. And we know that she rose up a forgiven individual, washed and made new. She gave her life to follow her Savior for the rest of her life. Look at Matthew a tax gatherer, despised by the nation of Israel. Yet Christ offers him forgiveness, restoration, a new life, a new pathway, a new purpose, 
Look at Thomas, a doubter, refused to believe Christ, yet Christ reached out to him. Asked Thomas to reach out to Christ, to connect the dots, to restore him, to provide hope for all of us through him. Look at the thief on the cross, a guilty criminal, deserving of death. Yet Christ looked over to him and said, Today you will be with me in paradise. Look at Christ on the cross. He only spoke seven statements while nailed to it. There he is. Near death, all the abuse that humanity could hurl at him. And yet, listen to what he says. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Look at Peter, broken and filled with despair. How could he have done it? How could he have betrayed the one he knew was Lord? He cried out, you are the Christ. And there he is, in a heap of tears, after he betrayed the Lord, not once, <laughs> not twice, but three times. And Scripture says, he went out and wept bitterly, more salty tears. How the sound of the rooster was ringing in his ears night and day. How could he escape the memory? How could he remove the pain? How could he handle the guilt and the shame? And then Christ rises from the dead and comes to Peter. After all of that, how many of us would say, what kind of friend are you? What kind of follower are you? What kind of companion are you? But he doesn't. He knows where Peter's at. He knew well in advance what Peter would do. And our Lord knew in advance how he would respond. And he comes to Peter and gently restores him, not once, not twice, three times. For every hit, for every hurt that Peter provided, our Lord provided forgiveness. And Christ extends to Peter in that moment the wonderful wonderful grace of God. Look at your own life. What kind of touch do you need from Christ for your guilt, your shame, your sorrow? God's forgiveness is communicated through His Son. But what we need to know is also God's forgiveness is complete in his son. We need to know a few things about God's forgiveness that sets it apart from everything else we know, we can see, we can touch, we can experience. A fie me means to let go of, to cancel, to release, to pardon, ultimately to forgive. Carries the idea of releasing a person's debt. And wiping that slate clean carries the idea of releasing a prisoner, having given them a complete pardon. Every four years or so, eight if our president is reelected, there comes this moment in time where the presidents offer pardons. And they offer pardons to all kinds of people. You may remember, oh, a few years ago, this thing called Pardon Gate. Those that were absolutely guilty of crimes, President Clinton, 
provided pardons to a few that many would say, please don't. But those individuals that are kind of hoping beyond hope for a pardon, they know the one thing they desperately need is for someone to remove the guilt, someone to provide the pardon, someone to come along and say, we'll forgive the crime, and you're free to go. And yet we all know it never really works that way. We all know it's never really canceled, because even with the best pardon, there'll always be some residual effect. Oh yeah, the president pardoned him, but you know (laughs) the kind of person they are. They have to live with the scars of their unethical behavior. And it may take a lifetime before people will ever, ever trust them again. And the truth is, while many seek the pardon of men, man can never pardon completely. No matter how many times we say, pardon me. That's the way it always is when we forgive. It's never really complete. There's always some reminder of our past, some guilt that we can't seem to shake, some guilt that we can't seem to get rid of. But God's forgiveness is never, ever like our forgiveness, which is why it's so hard to grasp it. It's so hard to comprehend it. It's so hard sometimes to even experience it. But God's forgiveness is complete, absolutely complete in his Son. Paul writes in Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 through 14, For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. And then in verses 19 through 20, he writes, For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace. Having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. And then the most remarkable statement is made in chapter 2, verses 13 through 14. And when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with Christ, having forgiven, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which were hostile to us. They spoke against us. They charged us over and over and over again. He's taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Now the passage, I think, needs some explaining because I want us all to get what God is saying. God's Word says that every time we sin against Him, we make a debit charge to our account. We get a speeding ticket, a violation. So when we violate His standards or we don't live up to His standards, we incur a debt. And those debts pile up, much like our debit statement, until the debt is paid in full. You're charging on an account you can't pay. And the problem is that none of us can pay the debt So it accumulates over time. Just think about this. Think about it. You know, you're a young child, you know, not a baby. But as soon as you can say your first word, it's not far too long before it's a bad word. And as you get older, the words get worse. The attitudes get worse, the behavior gets worse, and we start speeding through life. Oh, the signs are up telling us to slow down, but we avoid those things. I mean, don't we? Got to go fast. Got to get there. Got to get it done. 
Sign says turn right, you decide to go left. Oh, you get lost along the way. Sign says go left, you go right. Light says stop, you say go. It's just the way it is. And through our journey, we collect a huge stack of violations. Well, they're just all piled up. And over time, they become overwhelming. But the passage also says that in Christ, all those debts are canceled. All those debts are removed. And they're canceled because they're nailed to the cross. Here we have a different word, not a fie me, but ex alefain. It's an amazing word because it means more than just to forgive. The word means to cancel out any record, but even more so, it means to wash away. Not just to cancel, but to wipe completely clean or to whitewash over. The imagery is of writing upon papyrus, which could be removed by a wet sponge. It's the old black chalkboard. And all your debts are written up there. But then someone takes a wet rag and washes that blackboard clean until it's absolutely spotless. That is the imagery. It's like washing that with a wet sponge until no writing remains upon it, no writing at all. So when God cancels our debts, he just doesn't cross them out. He erases them. Scripture says, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our sins from us. On my computer, there's a folder called Trash Bin. The trash bin is where you place documents that you want to get rid of. I don't want that hanging around anymore don't like that. So I click on it and I send it over to the trash bin. And the problem with that is simply this. Over time, well, we just keep filling up that trash bin. I don't know if you ever notice that. You go down there, you click on that, you open it up, everything is still in the trash bin. The problem is that unless you empty the trash bin folder, The documents remain. They can be pulled up at any time. They can be reviewed at any time. Or they can be copied. They can even be printed. Oh, you got rid of them. You put them in the trash bin. But they're there. And they can haunt you if you let it. The only way to remove the record of the document is to empty the trash bin. Our sins are recorded much in the same way. We can try to delete them from our lives. We can try to delete them from our memories. But even though we delete them, they go into the trash bin and they remain there. The only way they can be removed is if God empties the trash bin. Oh, they're there, but only God can empty the trash bin. And when God empties the trash bin, it remains empty forever. You can open it up. There's not going to be anything there. If you don't have Christ You can do everything in your power with all your might, all your strength, the whole of your mentality. You can click and click and click and click and click till your finger falls off. They will remain in that trash bin forever. It's only in Christ that God clicks the delete button. And they are removed 
forever. And when we stand before the Lord and He opens up the Lamb's book of life, that trash bin is empty. A new folder opens up. It's called the righteousness of Christ. And believe you me, that puppy is filled to overflowing. But if you don't have Christ, you're not in that Lamb's book of life. There's another book, and it's opened up. And no matter how the individual soul cries out their innocence, all you have to do is look into the trash bin, and you see a soul that's trashed. And the biggest of which is the rejection of his son. That one is at the top. Everything else is listed below. And that one is bold-faced and italicized. When God empties it, there's no record, no remnant, no reminder. They're all washed away. Thirdly, God's forgiveness is conditioned upon his son. If you don't embrace his son by faith, that trash bin remains full. Without Christ, the documents remain, and one day God is going to open up that folder. Whatever you have in it, God is going to lay it before your eyes to see it. John chapter 3, verses 16 through 18 tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. That's the passion narrative. God knows what's best for us. So he sent his best in his son. But it goes on to say, for he who believes in him is not judged. Why? Because the trash bin is empty. He who does not believe has been judged already. Why? Well, here it is. Because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. One day God will open up the book and there's that document and it's going to say they did not believe in my Son. And so here's the good news of Christianity. This is the great news of Christianity. That God has given His very best for our very best. So we spend eternity with him. And when we embrace his son, God the Father embraces us. And he takes our trash bin and the living God takes the trash out. And as Christ cried out, It is finished. That's it. That's the story. That's the great news of the gospel. God, the living God, takes our trash out, takes our trash upon him, and trashes it. How's that for a play on words? The whole purpose of the passion is that we find pardon in the sight of the living God and it is a complete, complete, perfectly complete pardon for our souls. And so for those that are here looking for that kind of forgiveness, it's available for you today. God calls you to do two things. Just two things. To believe in him 
to believe in what he's done and to repent. That's it, two things. To believe, to put your faith, to put your trust, to place your life into the hands of the living God and to turn, to repent, to do a 180 turn from what was to what is, what you were doing to what the Lord might want to do in and through you. But we just believe and we turn. We turn from a life of our own will to his will. A life of our own efforts to allowing him to work in and through us. It's an exchange. But we turn to him and we place our faith in him. And we accept God's gift of him. And we accept his son. We accept his conditions. And we accept God on his terms. To turn from a life that lives apart from him, a life that lives in opposition to him, and to turn to him and live a life that seeks to please him, that lives to adore him, that lives to learn more about him, learns more about how to follow him, that everything I once thought was is completely overhauled and turned upside down because I now learn for the first time in my life what it's really all about and the lengths that God went to rescue my pathetic soul. To ask Christ into your heart and to experience God's forgiveness in the most powerful, powerful of ways. For those of us that are here that know Christ, heard this message before, it's a reminder of all we know to be true. All those scripture references should just echo within our hearts. It's the eternal truth that grips our hearts. It's that truth that guides our lives. That we can shout praises to our Lord because we know that our slate is clean, that we can stand on the rooftops and proclaim our king because we have life in him. 1 John chapter 5, verse 11 through 13 says, it is written to affirm such truth. And the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. It's nowhere else. He who has the son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Many of us here this morning are here and we know it. We rest in it. We're assured of it. That no matter what happens in this life, we can endure it because he's holding on to us. My prayer has been that there's someone here who doesn't know him, searching for him, looking for him, wanting to find God's forgiveness. And they don't know what we know. They don't know. When they lay awake at night in the quiet and the stillness and the darkness of of that night, and they're pondering the deep things of life, their own journey, wondering. Or maybe they're ill and they're facing some real serious stuff and they start thinking about this stuff. And they wonder. Here's the deal. They don't know what they desperately, desperately need is to know. So here this morning, if that's you, our Lord wants you to know not just the truth, but the truth brings you to the place where you know Him. An intimate relationship. The Spirit of God in you, breathing life into you, making you new. And when that happens, you know 
And you lay awake at night. And the worst of life is coming at you. And yeah, the fear is there, but you have faith. This is not the end. It's just bringing you closer to the king. I am Groot. <laughs> That's the hope we have, men and women. We live in desperate times. And people fall prey to desperate measures to get through a desperate life. All the guilt, all the shame, all the pain, all the sorrow. It goes on and on and on and on. We endure that too as believers. But we have something. And it has to matter. And it does make a difference. And so as we conclude this morning, I would just encourage us all, take the time to ponder the passion. If we don't get the purpose of it, to pardon our pathetic souls, then all of this is just such a waste of time. It is the only thing that matters in this life and in the life to come. Take the time to ponder the passion. If you're here and you don't know him, ask him to be your Lord. Ask him to be your savior. Say, I've had enough. I thought I had it, but I don't get it. But now I do. And I may not get everything right, but i got to get this thing right. So I'm going to bring my life to you. As best as I can, as simply as I can, I'm going to bring it to the cross. And I'm going to ask you to come into my life and to be my savior, to be my Lord that you went to such lengths, such cost. I mean, my land, I spent time on Good Friday walking through Isaiah 53 and, and the tragedy of it all. And one by one, people came up with their sins and they, they left it at the cross. Because it said, if you walk out the door and you keep it with you and you don't put it there, then you carry that with you. You carry everything that goes with it. The shame, the guilt. That's where we find our forgiveness. That was all to bring us to here. Every one of those washed away. But one by one, we came up and we pinned it to the cross. And we leave it there because he's the only one who can carry it. He's the only one that can care for it. So if you're here and you don't know him, it's a come to Jesus moment. If you're here and you know him, but you're not right with him, you too bring a certain weight with you. Leave it at the cross. while we're forgiven eternally, while we're forgiven completely, the dust, the debris, the muck, the mire that we drag in, that too needs to be washed away. Why? So we walk away and we feel refreshed. We know that we're right with the Lord. So all of us here this morning can celebrate the forgiveness of God in Christ Jesus. Because isn't that our greatest need? To be a forgiven people? Knowing that as we're forgiven, once we're forgiven, we are restored. The longings of the soul, the deep longings of the soul, satisfied in the Savior of our soul. I'd encourage us. I've left some of those pieces of paper up there. Lord, I leave this at the cross. 
And we're going to close the service. We're going to worship and we'll go out and fellowship. But if some of you are here and you want to have a moment with the Lord, I'd encourage you to stay. Reflect. Take a piece of paper. Leave it at the cross. It's what it's there for. Whatever it is, large or small, don't carry it with you out the door. Don't carry it with you through the week. Don't carry it with it for the rest of your life. Bring it here. Leave it at the cross. But if you're here this morning and you don't know him, I'd ask that you spend a moment and you pray and you ask him into your life. You want more information? You want to talk? We're available. But in this moment, it's all you need to do, two things. Believe and turn to him. And watch what the living God will do in your soul. I'm here to tell you, if that's you and you come up and you do that, you are going to sleep differently tonight. And I'm telling you, you're going to open up this thing called the Bible, and it's going to come alive. And you're going to go, whoa. Because for the first time, you're going to sense the Spirit of God speaking to you. And your life is going to be changed. And you will know. I want to finish the passage, or finish with a passage from 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 15 through 17. It is a great doxology. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am the foremost of all. Yet for this reason I found mercy, so that in me is the foremost. Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we... (laughs) We are speechless. At least I am. How do we begin to express how thankful we are for all that you've done on our behalf? How do we ever express our gratitude and our love for so great a salvation? How do we begin to express our thankfulness for your overwhelming forgiveness and grace to reach into our lives and because of your love, even when we resist, even when we fight back, you still reach you still wait patiently, whispering to our souls, all who are weary and heavy laden, come to me, and I will give you rest for your souls if we would only come. And so we are here on this day to celebrate the resurrection that all is true. But in celebrating all of this, we celebrate and we rest in this amazing forgiveness. That's the purpose of the passion. To pardon our souls. To make us right with you. So every day that we sense that, every day that we can rest in that, oh my land, Father, our only response is to worship you. 
and to love you. So help us, I pray, this day that all of us leave it at the cross. And as we leave, we carry that cross and we become difference makers for you, we pray. All in the name of our Lord Christ Jesus. Amen.